Hello and welcome to a new interview from MinMax. MinMax is a place about games, friends, and getting better. Thank you for being here. My name is Ben Hansen. Today's interview is with the one and only Reggie fils former president of Nintendo of America, talking about his new book, Disrupting the Game. In this interview, we talk about what it's like working at the highest levels of Nintendo, working with Miyamoto, working with Iwata, the challenges he faced along the way in communicating with the Kyoto office. Also in this interview, we talk about Reggie's time working at GameStop on the board of directors. But just to be fully transparent, this interview was recorded before the recent layoffs at GameStop and Game Informer. We hope you learned a thing or two from this interview, and if you enjoy this interview, you can always help support independent games media by subscribing to MinMax's YouTube channel or jumping over to patreon.com slash minmax with two ends where you can unlock the podcast version of this interview and all of our other interviews. If you enjoyed this one, you'd probably enjoy our interview with the director of Super Mario RPG or with Giles Goddard, the programmer responsible for creating the Super Mario 64 face and a ton more stuff at Nintendo. He talks about his earliest prototypes for Ocarina of Time in that interview. There's a bunch more like it, so any help sharing this interview is appreciated. And now, without further ado, here's Reggie fils Reggie, welcome to MinMax, sir. Ben, great to be with you. Thank you for taking the time. Really appreciate it. Uh, hey, congratulations on the book. Uh, read it, thoroughly enjoyed it. It came out, I guess, a while ago now. How's the reception been? What's it like on your end? Yeah, the reception has been really, really outstanding. You know, I have to say, candidly, even better than I could have ever imagined. So the book launched on May 3rd. In its first week, it was a Wall Street Journal bestseller. As we sit here today, I have over 500 five-star reviews. So the readers have really gravitated toward it. And I have to tell you, Ben, it was a bit of a risk in that the book is not a Nintendo tell-all. That's not what I wanted to create. It really is a personal memoir coupled with a leadership lessons learned book. And the reaction by the readers, whether they are game industry fans, whether they're uh, business leaders, has really been positive. So I've, I've been just thrilled by that reaction. Yeah, I was intrigued on um, Game Informer's podcast with Brian Shea. You mentioned that this wasn't your first idea for a book. Um, and I'm curious, like, what was the, the logic there? Was it that you didn't want to step in any toes at Nintendo, even going to that history? You know, it's like, ah, I'll probably have to run it by Nintendo legal. It seems messy. Or what was the philosophy for shying away from the big obvious thing? Well, my hope was that as an author, I could do multiple books. And so this memoir was on the trajectory, but I wanted to do something maybe a little bit lighter to start. And that first idea, you know, this concept of how you learn real life skills by playing video games, I, I thought was, was a, a great idea, very, very, you know, in the moment, in the gestalt of the moment. Yeah. But the, uh, the publisher and other folks I talked to said, you know, Reggie, that's a great idea for a speech that you can give. And I'm sure it would, you know, have great resonance, but it's not, it's not a book idea. So that's what then led to this book. And, you know, we'll see from here if there's another book idea in me. I'm, I'm just not sure. I mean, as much as I enjoyed the book, there's also a part of me where it's like, look, I know it's a ton of work, but little thin, little thin. There's a lot of history that you could have covered with Nintendo in this book, I mean, did you take notes on your time? Do you feel like there's still a mountain to unpack that you're excited to unpack about your time at Nintendo? You know, what's interesting is, you know, during my time with the company, it's not that I was taking copious notes. By nature, as an executive, I, I do take notes. I do, you know, write questions into a journal and things of that nature. But all of those journals were left behind at Nintendo of America. So hmm. I, I didn't keep any of those. So, yeah, the the book really is created from my memory of key moments. And each of those moments is truly punctuated by a lesson. You know, as you said, there are a lot of things that happened during my 16 year tenure at Nintendo. But I wanted each story to punctuate a lesson, to punctuate an insight versus just be you know, eyes behind the curtain as to what was going on in Nintendo at that particular time. Yeah. I mean, so do you think if you were to write another book about history at Nintendo, you'd kind of sit down with someone to help you unpack those ideas? I mean, you could have like a 
Walter Isaacson type even sit down and really unpack like the full history? Do you think that would be a, a more, I don't know, fruitful way to go? You know, I, I, I honestly don't believe that that type of book is interesting to me. You know, and I, I know it would be really interesting to fans, but for me as a writer, it's just not that interesting. And I, I would argue, in fact, if you go back and look at all of the E3 presentations and the follow on interviews and the interviews that I would do going into, you know, the key product launches, you can pretty much string a history of Nintendo just based on all of those public comments. You know, for me, uh, I just don't see that as something interesting and, and worthy of my time to write. That's interesting. But surely you're a fan of film, uh, some other mediums. And you think of just how much history was lost throughout time. Don't you feel that idea of like you had such an amazing perspective on one of the most important companies in the history of entertainment, ultimately, as we're moving into the future here? Do you feel any, I don't know, allegiance to history just for like, well, we should probably get what we can out there for the sake of the history of this entire medium? You know, one of the things that I think is different, though, versus as you consider the movie space, or as you consider literature, you know, first, we're living in a time when so much is being documented in real time in video and audio. And so, again, you can go back and watch that 2014 uh, E3 and see a very young Reggie in front of all of those lights, you know, delivering that famous line. You could go see it for yourself. You can see the reaction of the DS and the launch of the Wii. You can go back and see all of that information yourself. So I don't feel that there's a need to further document all of that information. Certainly, I was privy to a lot of behind the scenes conversations, right. all of the twists and turns in key products making it out to the marketplace. And again, I cover some of that in the book. Yeah, for sure. But but I, I, I don't see, at least for me, that's not a project that would be interesting. I think there's actually a lot of other documentary type of ideas that are much more interesting in the video game space. Yeah, I think one of the most interesting parts of the book was when you would just throw out a name of somebody that you worked a lot with that seemed very important. And even as somebody who is obsessed with the industry, has been in it for a while, there's still names that I don't know, like Don James or Mike Fukuda, where it's like, oh, who are these names? Don Varyu, he came up over and over and over again. It's like, I don't know these names at all. Um, and it's a fascinating part of the history of the company. I hope you can unpack at some point or they can unpack at some point. But in there, you mentioned how you sat down with Mike and kind of got the inside track on the history of Nintendo and what you needed to learn when you were first starting there. Is there anything you can share, any insights that, that really clicked for you in that discussion with Mike about what you need to know about working within Nintendo? You know, absolutely. And again, what was what was interesting about that conversation was that I had such significant history as a player. Right. I, I played Donkey Kong Arcade. I played uh, the SNES. I went back and played some of the early uh, NES content. Uh, I had experience with PlayStation, PlayStation 2. I had experience with the original Xbox. So. It wasn't so much looking back on the history of the company or the history of the industry. It was much more in my discussions with Mike, it was understanding the culture of Nintendo, right. understanding how the company thinks about new products, how they think about game development. You know, it was giving me a front row seat to how Shigeru Miyamoto and his team thinks about game development. It was giving me insight as to how the company thinks about product launches and the lead up to key product launches. Those were the critical insights that I needed to have as I was in that moment leading the sales and marketing for Nintendo of America. You know, 50% of the sales and profits for global Nintendo and arguably the, the key subsidiary that would take the lead in so many of the marketing activities. So it was, a, is, it was an introduction to the culture of the company, to the mentality of game development from the company's perspective, as well as understanding from his perspective, some of the issues and challenges that Nintendo of America had had 
uh, as the subsidiary with the parent uh, uh, Nintendo in Japan. And that, again, was critically important because I would have to navigate through those historical challenges. I would I would have to be the one, you know, understanding problems that had happened in the past and thinking through, OK, how are we going to launch a brand new advertising campaign? How are we going to enroll the people who need to be enrolled? But make no mistake, we would do what would be right for the marketplace and right for the gamer. Yeah, that relationship between Washington and Kyoto is the most fascinating part of the book. And it's the most fascinating thing about Nintendo, I think, especially I imagine on the inside, that is where so much is happening is just how clear can you get that hallway of communication between those two entities? What um, insight did you get about just the do's and don'ts when it comes to making sure everybody's aligned with the Nintendo? You know, in, in terms of the do's and don'ts, in, in one way, it was very straightforward, meaning, you know, you needed to be clear in your communication because, you know, this is the ultimate uh, game of telephone, meaning, you know, with the exception of Mr. Iwata, with the, you know, Mr. Uh, Miyamoto has partial understanding of partial fluency in English, but so many of the other key executives really did not have fluency in English. I, and I have no fluency in Japanese. And so this process of making a statement in English having it be translated into Japanese, the person responding in Japanese, having that being then translated into English, you needed to be very precise with your language, whether your spoken language or written language. And in being precise, it, it needed to drive a level of clarity in what it was that you were proposing or what it was that, that the development teams or other leaders in Kyoto were trying to communicate. So that that precision of language was just so critically important. And then also the competitive situations were so different between let's call it the Western markets where Xbox was already a formidable competitor versus in the Japanese market where Xbox was non-existent for all intents and purposes. Uh, and the only competitor to worry about from their perspective was Sony. So, you know, navigating all of these differences, navigating these uh, these uh, perspectives that were quite uh, different and coming from different places, that was such a key challenge of the job. And, and so clarity of communication, clarity of strategy, you know, what, what did I want to do? Why did it make sense? Making sure that that was well understood. And then at times, you know, candidly being the brash American and really pushing hard for a point of view, even though that initiative might not work in Japan, but knowing that it was the right thing to do for the Western markets. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about that management committee in Kyoto that you talked about that I believe you even asked Iwata repeatedly, it seemed like. To, to, be, could, to be part of? Yeah. Yeah. Can you outline just... Is that the main roadblock when you'd be pushing for an initiative and then it would come up against, eh, the management committee says, not quite, Reggie? You know, uh, what, what I wouldn't say is that they were the roadblock, but th they were the group. And it was, it was a very limited group of executives, right? It was uh, Mr. Wada, Mr. Miyamoto, uh, Mr. Takeda, who was the, the hardware uh, developer, um, you know, created all of the, the systems, even, you know, had some partial involvement with the Nintendo Switch, even though he was, um, you know, retired at that point. Um, you know, the, the CFO uh, was a key person and, and that was about it. It was a very small group that were making key decisions, meeting every couple of weeks in Kyoto and making sure that that collective group had an understanding of our marketplace, had an understanding of the issues we are facing, had an understanding of what we wanted to do and why, it was just so critically important. And, you know, the, for me, it was a practice of influence to, to influence Mr. Wada, to influence Mr. Miyamoto, members of my team were focused on influencing other members of that management committee 
to make sure that we could press forward with our key initiatives. Fortunately, you know, th there was support for what it was that we were trying to do. And, and Mr. Awada managed uh, in a bit of a hands-off way once there was strong trust. Uh, but, you know, it was a challenge. And it was why I pushed to be part of that group, because I did believe that there wasn't as much Western perspective. There wasn't as much understanding of the marketplace on a global basis and outside of Japan. Um, that's why I pushed so hard. And eventually, uh, at the time, it was Mr. Kimishima who formally succeeded Mr. Uh, Awada and who I had a relationship with, given he was chairman for Nintendo of America for so many years. In the end, it was uh, Mr. Kimishima who put in place this executive committee format that had more executives participating in some of the communication and, and decisions to lead the company. And that kind of replaced the old management committee then? It was in addition to, okay. uh, you know, that that management committee exists today with a, a, a different uh, lineup of participants. So that that biweekly meeting of executives continues today, to my understanding, you know, now that I've been retired for three years. Yeah. And then the the ex the uh, the committee of uh, executive officers is now in addition. Gotcha. Um, and so that committee is the one that kind of greenlights projects overall as well. They're the one that says, yes, we should make a new Mario game and it should look like this. And then it trickles down you know, from there. No, the, the, it is the more limited executive committee in Kyoto that really is making the, the key decisions. And, and, uh, and really, when it comes to greenlighting a, a Mario game, that's done by the head of development, right? And certainly that person will, will get uh, input or perspective from Mr. Miyamoto, given his, you know, his uh, his birthing of that franchise. <laughs> but that type of decision really is made by the head of that department. Um, not not necessarily the timing for when the game can get launched will be discussed in the smaller executive committee. But the decision of which games to green light and and, you know, tentative launch schedules, that's made in a much different form. Gotcha. Um, I thought it was a really interesting section of the book where you talked about how you really needed to get it in writing that you were going to be the final say on all marketing for your area, um, that one person needs to be driving, needs to be steering. Can you talk about that philosophy and why that was so important to you to say like, hey, everything comes back to me. I just need to make sure that's clear as I step into this role. Yeah, and that was learning from all of my prior experience before joining Nintendo. So again, as I went into the sales and marketing leadership role, I, I had some 20 years of experience across a range of industries, a range of companies. And at that point, I knew that key decisions needed to be made by one person. You could certainly build consensus. You could certainly get uh, perspective from others. And you needed to make sure that a particular initiative would not be uh, blocked by some other department or inability of another department to execute. But in the end, key decisions need to, needed to be made by, by one person. And as I walked into Nintendo of America, th there was uh, a history of different parts of the organization well, shouldn't on some key initiatives. There was a feeling that uh, the advertising development process in particular was broken in terms of how things moved forward. And that's why I spent time in my early months with the company creating a very clear and very detailed process for how we would approve advertising in particular. And we had similar processes for uh, sales initiatives and things of that nature. But I, I needed to be clear that while there were some areas where we were seeking consensus and there were areas where different parts of the company needed to have input, in the end, I was making the call and it's because I was responsible, right? If it didn't work, it would come back to me. 
Yeah. And so if it's not going to work, I want to make sure that uh, that I've done my best effort to make sure that the uh, the very best idea has been put out in the marketplace. So that's why that's why that structure was required. And I would argue in any organization today, there are problems find and that clear and one individual needs to truly have ownership because oftentimes this type of creation by committee just never works. Yeah. Um, why don't uh, the layups happen at Nintendo? I know you're a basketball fan. If we're once more from the outside, I just kind of wonder like, why isn't there Netflix on the Switch? Why aren't these things that just seem so obvious happening? Where, where are the obstacles for things that just seem like no brainers? You know, I, I, uh, I would share that the insight is that, in fact, these types of decisions aren't no brainers, right? And meaning that, you know, for for some sort of service to be made available on the switch, well, you know, the, you need the uh, the software, the the operating approach needs to be clear. Um, you know, there's a level of detail required and investment of some sort or another, right? Either uh, human investment from a development standpoint or financial investment, whatever the case may be. And, you know, those those decisions need to be worked through. Um, you know, the interesting thing you bring up Netflix. Well, you know, today you could get Netflix on just about any device. Right. right? So from that perspective, why do I need it on Switch? Right. Think about it from that perspective. Why invest time, money and effort to put it on one more device when arguably you can already get access to your Netflix content on a different device? Why spend the time, money and effort? That's the question that I would ask, uh, you know, in a, in a leadership perspective versus other things that could be best done. Gotcha. Uh, to go back in time a little bit, um, I thought another interesting part of the book was when you were talking about when you were at VH1 and wanting to develop games for the VH1 website, and you reached out to the founders of Vicarious Visions, the, the Bala brothers. Um, what were those games going to look like? I'm so curious, like what those talented developers could have made for VH1 back in the day. You know, and, and again, you, you really need to time warp to the you know early 2000s. And in the early 2000s, uh, web pages were not very well developed. Um, there really was not a lot of interactivity on web pages. And so my idea was, you know, how do we marry games with popular culture, music in particular, and create something that's going to motivate the, 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 the visitor to the website to spend more time on the site, to be exposed to more advertising messages, to be, uh, you know, essentially further wrapped by the brand that is VH1. And I think we could have done a lot of really interesting things. What, what, what for me was, was fascinating was getting an initial exposure to the video game business, especially from a developer's perspective. Right. Because at this point, the, the Bala Brothers and, and Vicarious Visions were already successful developers, uh, in particular for the uh, Game Boy Advance. They had created a number of games on that platform. And for them, what they needed to do was to generate revenue by working with a partner like VH1, generate revenue uh, in between these big game launches that would just help sustain the studio. So it was very interesting just to get early perspective on what it's like to be a developer, you know, how they think, how they manage their projects. And, uh, you know, and imagine for me on, on uh, really my first couple months on the business that I'm finding out that Vicarious Visions is a key partner for Nintendo of America, all this great content. And it enabled me to, to maintain that relationship with the Balas that I, I continue to have today. Yeah. Um, was that relationship kind of the, the core um, genesis of Mario Kart Live? Because they ended up developing that. Was that relationship started there? Well, 
really the the relationship with the Baller Brothers, as I said, goes back to some of the early games they did for Game Boy Advance. Um, they did some fantastic content for the Nintendo DS. Uh, you know, they did uh, a version of Guitar Hero for the Nintendo DS yeah. that utilized the peripheral. Um, you know, they were involved in just so many games that performed well on the Wii. So the, they have a long and positive history with the company that as they went on their own and, and started working on new projects, it was it was a natural place where conversations would happen. And, you know, they had been doing some really interesting work on the technology that is involved in in the, the Mario Kart circuit game um, that, uh, you know, that when they took that idea to the developers in Kyoto, the, the, the Kyoto developers were just blown away. Yeah. So, you know, the key insight here is that you know, oftentimes these relationships with independent developers are forged over years and years and years that develop trust on the part of the Kyoto-based developers that that really lead to some magical, magical games. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious if you ever had any interesting interactions with uh, Steven Spielberg with Boom Blocks. I mean, there must have been a, a relationship there, yeah? Well, the, certainly the company had a relationship, um, and in particular, Mr. Miyamoto and uh, Steven Spielberg had a relationship. When when we first launched the Wii in 2006 at that E3, I believe Steven Spielberg and members of his team came and had a hands-on demo led by uh, Mr. Miyamoto. You know that led to their interest in uh, game development and, and doing some work. So again, you know, the, the relationship was there and was based over time. Personally, I wasn't involved in uh, in those discussions. You know, I was at the time, you know, focused on what we needed to do from a um, relationship uh, with retailers' perspective and making sure that they saw the potential of the we and what we were trying to do with our key strategies. So during that E3 and and uh, and the months that followed, it really was a focus on those relationships. Um, you know, certainly Mr. Miyamoto, uh, Mr. Iwata were able to handle the developer relationships uh, all too well. Yeah, I, I like that in the book you describe uh, Miyamoto as a showman, that he enjoyed getting up on stage and swinging a sword around and do all that fun stuff. Was that mainly where that was coming through or like, the idea of Miyamoto as a showman, was that coming through even in your private meetings or behind the scenes discussions? Uh, very much in the private uh, conversations as well. I mean, when, when, he, you know, he's, what, what people don't understand is that, you know, e even when you're the world's foremost game developer, you're pitching ideas, right? You're, you're pitching an idea for, for what a game could be, what a concept could be. And from that perspective, Mr. Miyamoto is a great salesman. Hmm. And so when we would be in big group meetings and he's pitching a point of view and selling a perspective, you know, he's animated, he's got that smile, you know, he is in full pitch mode. And so, you know, that is a key part of his personality and something that has served him well in not only creating all of this wonderful IP, but pitching all of these fantastic game ideas. Yeah. Did he uh, ever give feedback on the book? Was there ever any back and forth between you and him? You know, the, the way that I constructed the book, you know, it was all, you know, my personal point of view, my remembrance of the conversations, my, uh, you know, my view on, you know, how these different ideas progressed. And so, you know, from from that uh, from that design, it wasn't something that I needed approval for or needed perspective. So, you know, I hope he's read it. I hope he's enjoyed it. I hope he, uh, you know, likes the way I've described our conversations and our interactions. Um, but at this point, I haven't gotten any feedback. I haven't gotten any feedback really from anyone. Uh, in Kyoto, um, that is still with the company. Other, I've I've received feedback from others who've retired. Uh, they were quite uh, positive and complimentary on the book. So that and that that itself is meaningful. 
Yeah. Were you kind of dreading a call from Kyoto from some lawyer? Uh, like, you know, oh, I, um, I, I wasn't dreading it because again, I, I, I know in the way that I constructed it, I didn't need their approval. Uh, but I, I certainly would not have been happy to, uh, to get any kind of last minute pushback of, Hey, you know, you got to change this, that, or the other thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Maybe it's just cause I'm based in Minnesota here, but I've always been curious about the relationship with monster games. It feels like for a while they were being built up as kind of a, a second retro, if you will, right? They're working on the Donkey Kong Country series and they ported Xenoblade Chronicles of the 3DS. What uh, was your perspective on that relationship and why do you think it didn't go further than it did? Because now iRacing owns them officially, um, but why weren't they kind of blown up and acquired into a, a larger development studio? You know, that, that it's a question I can't answer, you know, and um, let, let me twist it around and, and use a different example. Right. So next level games. Yeah. You know, next level games, you know, again, did such great historical work for the company, uh, a great partner in uh, developing content and, and relaunching great content. Right. With Luigi's Mansion, you know, how they got to a point of being acquired by Nintendo. I, I can't, I can't answer. I can't give that, uh, that perspective. It happened after my tenure with the company, but all I can say is that certainly the, the relationship that they had with the key developers in Kyoto were so strong. The trust was so strong in, in working with key Nintendo intellectual property, that it's based on those types of long-term relationships that, you know, the, these forms, uh, these bonds form over time. So, you know, I can't answer uh, in detail for either situation other than to look at uh, next level games as, you know, the opposite end of the spectrum where the relationship continued to blossom to the point that they did become part of the Nintendo family. Gotcha. They're doing it right. Um, I am fascinated by, there's a little tidbit of history where when you first revealed the Wii U, um, everybody was asking you, can we use multiple Wii U game pads? And eventually it was interesting because the messaging just came out and you all said, uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely you can. Here we go. And then it was never asked again and it was never implemented as far as I know. What was that like from your perspective? Just to throw that out there, like, yes, everybody, we can do this thing. Now let's move on and come up with new questions. Well, what please. was interesting is that, you know, with the Wii U, there was a full development plan for all of the interesting interactions and all of the interesting capabilities that the system could do. And so, you know, in, in that case, you know, technically could multiple game pads communicate with a Wii U? Answer was yes, but the install base never got large enough that, you know, that type of implementation made sense. And most importantly, the company didn't create a game where you needed another game pad right. in order to have a great experience. The, 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 you know, the development just never proceeded. And the lifespan of the Wii U ended up being so short that, um, that it just never came to pass. But, you know, it, it gets at the heart of, you know, when you're launching a new system, you know, it's, it's parsing through what's capable, and there are a lot of things that might be capable, but in order for those initiatives to come to life, they're, they're fun, at least from Nintendo's perspective, there needs to be a game that drives that implementation, that, that enables the player to see why you would need a second gamepad as an example. And that game creation process is just so critical. Yeah. And in the book, you talk about how the Wii U was a great stepping stone to get to the Switch and how you were big on communicating the idea that, OK, the takeaway is people want to be able to play their games anywhere, not within 15 feet of the Wii U here. Um, and then you say this became the core positioning for the NX, as it was called at the time. Or do you take any credit for driving that message home for the development of the NX or the Switch? You know, again, the, the development of the Switch was led out of Japan in Kyoto, right? And it, it was truly one of the final projects that Mr. Iwata was involved in. And so, you know, I, I take no quote unquote credit 
for uh, what is the Nintendo Switch. I certainly saw early versions. I certainly gave feedback and perspective. Um, in terms of the positioning, I do believe that I was a key advocate for that positioning and, and really pushed it with the senior executives within uh, within Nintendo. And so again, yeah, I, I don't think it's important to claim credit or not claim credit, but certainly that core positioning and driving home, playing anywhere, uh, anytime was uh, was what I believe to be just so critical. And and I I told everyone who would listen that I believe that that was the positioning that the the system needed to launch on, and and that's exactly what happened. Thank you, by the way, for answering so many questions about Nintendo. For somebody who's not interested in unpacking the history in books, imagine your life is nothing but fielding questions about the Duck Hunt IP for the rest of your life. Well, the, the Duck Hunt IP, I mean, imagine, uh, imagine in one of my first uh, presentations to all of the Nintendo of America employees, uh, we finished the presentation and we take questions. So, you know, again, this is probably 2004, maybe, maybe late 2004. So we're taking questions from the audience. And one of our own employees in 2004 is asking, you know, Reggie, what are, what's the company doing with the Kid Icarus franchise? <laughs> and at that point, Kid Icarus had only existed uh, as a NES game, right? right? What are we doing with the Kid Icarus franchise? I have no idea. And so, you know, how do you tap dance through that uh, with uh, with your own employees? So, yes, <laughs> I do get endless questions uh, on uh, on game franchises. I thank you for not asking me about mother the mother franchise. You've or mother answered 3. it. You've answered uh, a thousand it, times. You know, I, I have answered it a thousand times. <laughs> um, but yes, you know that is that is. Uh, you know, even today, you know, when I'm stopped by a fan, um, you know, when they share how important uh, the time frame that I led uh, Nintendo of America was was so important to their own gaming history or and their love for gaming, you know, that just brings a smile to my face. And even if at the end of that conversation they ask, you know, so you know, when is that? You know, Zelda Breath of the Wild, you know, follow up going to come out. Uh, you know, I, I have no idea. I'm, I'm a fan like you. I'm waiting for that to come out. Yeah. Um, so news broke recently that um, there's going to be an in-person E3 happening in 2023 uh, that Reed Pop, like the PAX team, they're going to be spearheading the whole thing. How are you feeling about it? Uh, you feel like you're ready to embrace E3 again? Do you think the industry is ready to embrace E3 again? Or are you putting your your eggs in Jeff Keighley's basket at this point? Well, uh, Jeff is a very dear friend uh, and I, you know, I, I continue to support him in any way and on any venture that he undertakes. So, you know, let's not pit uh, Summer Game Fest against uh, E3. Um, you know, as, uh, as someone who is still involved in the industry, what I believe is missing is that dedicated time. So, you know, in, in prior years, that three or four days when E3 captured the global imagination right. and captured the conversation and all of the big games were announced, you know, so many critical games had first play opportunities. I miss that. I absolutely miss that. Uh, and and what that represents, you know, what Repop does, uh, what the ESA does, how, how they move forward. I think everyone wants to see, and I I do hope they find a way to have an event over a limited number of days that captures the zeitgeist uh, globally. I, I think that'd be wonderful. I, I just like everyone else. I'm not quite sure what that looks like. Yeah. Uh, real quick, I love that you touched on your time briefly at GameStop um, in the book. Was the tone of that time in your life just kind of frustration or did you just have to laugh by the end of it and throw your hands in the air and be like, whatever, guys, <laughs> you're on your own here? Yeah, I, I certainly wasn't laughing. Um, what, what, I would, what I would say is that, you know, I, 
I joined the board of GameStop because I believe then, and I continue to believe today, that a dedicated games retailer with passionate employees uh, who love the overall gaming space, I believe there's a role for that company uh, in the industry and in helping the, the industry continue to grow. I fundamentally believe that. You know, the, the, the detail is how are you going to do that? Right. What are, what are going to be the key strategies? What are going to be the key approaches to drive that forward? And, and that's where I felt I was not uh, providing enough perspective and input as to what that would be. And, and that's what led to my decision to, uh, to not stand for reelection. Um, but, you know, I, I, uh, I hope that uh, the company, the franchise, and its employees have a meaningful place in the gaming industry moving forward. I really hope that. Well, it seems like step one would be Ryan Cohen kind of outlining a vision for shareholders, which they still haven't for, I mean, years now? Yeah, you know, look, I, I as, a, as a business leader and, and uh, executive, I do believe that the way to rally uh, a company and all of its constituents, its employees, its shareholders, its business partners, is you have to clearly articulate a vision. You have to help your constituents understand why that vision is meaningful and why it's good for them. And then you have to execute the heck out of it right. and drive it forward. Uh, that I, I do believe that is the proper recipe. And uh, as you say, that hasn't been done yet. Yeah, it's frustrating. Um, what... Um did you ever talk about Game Informer, by the way, when you're at GameStop? Did you ever have a suggestion? Were there any high-level discussions about Game Informer? Because as a as a fan and a former employee, I always just wonder uh, how much are they interested in supporting them? I, I hope it's in a big way. You know, a, again, um, I, I can say that during my time at Nintendo, you know, we we looked to Game Informer as a critical partner in what it was that we were trying to do. Uh, during my time on the board, we talked about Game Informer as a key part of how the, the, the overall GameStop business connects with fans and players. So, you know, it, it always was a key topic of conversation from my perspective. In terms of what's happening now uh, in either of those organizations, I can't say. But yeah. I, I do believe, again, I believe Game Informer has a key role uh, in this industry. What that looks like moving forward, I think, needs to continue to evolve. I, I, I believe it's very difficult as you know a, a, a largely print-based uh, execution plus the online execution. I, I think they have to think bigger as to what they can be uh, and continue driving that evolution. That's code for NFTs, Reggie? Uh, you know, please don't say. I've it. I've gone on I've gone on record, uh, and I continue to believe that that blockchain technology I do think can be very interesting in the gaming space. Simply, you know, doing an NFT isn't enough. Right. Uh, right. Uh, but you know how to utilize uh, blockchain technology? How to utilize you know the the the. Uh, secure contracts and things of that nature. I, I really believe that there's uh, there's core elements in the technology that could be applied to the gaming space. Hey, we'll see. We'll see if it stands the test of time. Um, I'm very excited to see what you do in the future. You tease that you're working on a documentary of some sorts or a podcast of some sorts. Well, I've done a podcast uh, yeah. with my good friend Harold Goldberg, and and I, you know, even as I've supported the book launch, I've enjoyed uh, doing a variety of different podcasts. What, what I know uh, and what you're experiencing as you execute your podcast is that it's a ton of work. And, you know, I, I still do believe I'm retired and I'm not sure if I want to take on that amount of work in terms <laughs> of the booking and the, the recording and the editing uh, and the, the seven episode uh, podcast that I did with Harold was just a ton of work, but I, I do enjoy the format. I do believe that, uh, 
that it is a, a key way in, in building an audience today. So we'll see. You can uh, just, and I am uh, working on a documentary idea with, with Harold, um, as well as uh, another good friend uh, from, my, uh, from my Cornell days. So yeah, continuing to work on a variety of different projects. That's awesome. So it's kind of a, a documentary of your life? It, it is not a personal documentary. Okay. Um, it's it's more a, a, a documentary set in the broad video game uh, space, but uh, but that's as much as I'll say because we've we got to we got to finish uh, fleshing out the idea before I could really say more. <laughs> sure. Well, hey, if you want to get more into podcasting but don't want to do any work, you're welcome as a guest at any time here at MinMax or jump on Kit and Krista's podcast whenever they'd love to have you. You can just sit back and crack wise and be a piece of cake. Exactly. But there's, there's, there's no financial benefit to doing all that. <laughs> That's right. Well, the boost from their Patreon would go up in such a huge way if you joined it that I think you could like cut a little bit, a little bit of that pie, I think. Oh, there you go. There you go. Uh, Reggie, thank you for your time, sir. Greatly appreciate it. Well, thank you so much. Thanks uh, for uh, for going back through time, reliving some of these different experiences. And again, thank you for the the very kind words on the book. It, it was it was a labor of love, and, and I'm, I'm thrilled to see the reaction. Yeah, it's awesome just to get a couple more stories out of Nintendo. We really appreciate it from the outside here. Cool. Thank you so much, and thank you for watching or listening to this interview with MinMax. You can always check out our playlist and find many more like it. Uh, subscribe to our channel if you want more interviews like this in the future. Thanks so much, everybody. Bye. If you thought, hey, this video wasn't bad, well, there's a whole lot more like it on MinMax's YouTube channel. Please help us out by subscribing to our channel and checking out the MinMax Show podcast, also available on your favorite podcast app, the best, most thorough discussion about games on the internet with the deepest dive, our monthly community trivia show with prizes called Trivia Tower, and a whole lot more. Thanks so much for your support, everybody. All you gotta do is click that subscribe button. We'd really appreciate it.